We're live. It's 7 p.m. in the UK. And thanks for those that are joining us right now who maybe watched us earlier on with Dr. Anthony Chafee for two hours. If you didn't check out that live stream question and answer, then have a look on my channel or Richard's channel for the playback and you should be able to see. Yes, we had Anthony Chafee. Anyway, Rich, how are you? Yes, very well. I don't know if you've seen the post that I did uh, earlier today. Um, probably about an hour ago, I did tag you in on Instagram, but it was um, a comment on my Facebook channel after the live with the three of us. And I'm going to read it out because I think it's it's pretty good. So Riffs by Chris said, no offense to anyone else, but these three guys have become my absolute favorite um, out of the entire Carnival universe. So if you missed that podcast wow. or that live that we did earlier, as Stephen said, feel free to check it out on any of our channels. Yeah, that's, that's nice. It's it's nice when you get those sort of comments, isn't it? And uh, it doesn't seem real sometimes, but it's really nice that people go out of their way. Um, so thanks, everyone, who's already posted some comments. So we've got uh, – let's have a, the, the first one here is from Jari. Uh, thoughts on NMN and your – Yes. Yeah. Nicotinamide mononucleotide, um, which yep. is a precursor for nic nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. Um, the thinking behind it is that it elevates the productivity of sirtuins and leads to all of these health benefits. But when you look into the benefits with N and NMN, I think it's easier to say nicotinamide mononucleotide is it than NMN. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, I found that. Yeah. It, it comes back to a, a number of pathways, one of which is like the um, uh, the elevation of glutathione, which is the body's master antioxidant, um, which we get from just being ketogenic. So is there a benefit to consuming NMN? If you are coming from, <laughs> if you are coming from a lifestyle of poor Ill, Ill health, uh, not a, a, a poor diet, shall we say, then certain compounds can confer a benefit. Um, same as such, if you suffer with cancer and you're going to continue to eat vegetables, but you increase your consumption of uh, broccoli or broccoli sprouts, which contains a compound called sulfropane, which is a known um, compound to fight uh, cancer. It's a known uh, anti-carcinogen uh, um, that's used in the treatment for cancer. But if you consume those compounds when your body doesn't need them, i.e. if you are ketogenic or carnivore, then they only cause more damage, at least in my opinion. You're already benefiting from the elevation of glutathione from being ketogenic or carnivore. Beta-hydroxybutyrate does this. NMN also can activate the NRF2 pathway, which is an oxidative stress pathway, which is the same pathway that um, lead, mercury, arsenic, and tobacco, uh, and so on and so forth will activate. So if you are a sick person, it can help. Um, if you are ketogenic or carnivore, I don't believe there's a benefit to taking such products. Um, sulfropane is another compound which is meant to, uh, or oh, sorry, resver resveratrol, uh, which is found uh, in other food compounds, uh, wine being one of them, which we're told increases sirtuins. But again, the, the research in regards to increased sirtuins, improving lifespan, um, is is shoddy at best. So for me, um, NMN is, is a no go. I don't believe that. It, it, it is very hard to say that. To try yeah, it. it is NMN. I did with um, the question. Yeah, it, it is surprisingly difficult to say. Nicotinamide mononucleotide sounds it rolls off exactly the tongue a lot better. Yeah. 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 Um, yes, yes. So look, ju just cut out all of these things. We don't need to detox. We don't need to put these other compounds in if we are living a ketogenic carnival lifestyle. This is the booty of producing compounds such as beta-hydroxybutyrate. It does all of these things, and we can save a whole ton of money. Yeah, absolutely. It's a coenzyme to NAD+, plus, just for people that want to know what that really is all about what we're talking about and that's sort of essential for energy production cells um so i'd like to dumb it down for some people out there like myself just keep it nice and basic i don't think you need to take it there's plenty of carnivores and there's plenty of um, humans that don't take it and thrive so 
Um, and the jury's still out on, on any benefits that, that it confers. Right. Okay. Sally Ann Mac Namara. That's a good name. Uh, 723 Dyer with hyperthyroid, three drops of iodine per day, casual, um, BBBE stroke carnivore for three years on and off. Celiac 2, 5'3", 157 pounds, now taking 5 milligrams of carbin, carbinazole, was, and it was 40 megagra, uh, milligrams, not losing weight, help. Do you want me to jump on or do you want to go first? Yeah, go on, yeah you, you jump on, sorry, I'm, uh, I'm yeah, trying but... to get all the questions ready. No worries. Yeah, there's so many different things to, to to take into account with this. I mean, um, I think this was one of the questions that popped up with Dr. Chafee earlier in regards to can taking iodine lead to um, to weight gain. Um, again, I mean, the short answer for me is, and, and I, basically what Anthony came came around to saying is that no, probably unless it's having an impact on 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 other hormone productions. Um, I don't believe that we should be taking compounds unless we need them. Um, do, do you need them? It, you know, is the question. Stephen would be the best one to to come uh, around and answer that because he is the bloods man. Um, but in regards to not losing weight, I mean, there's so many other variables in there. You know, are you eating enough? Are you are you eating too much? Are you consuming too much fat? Are you eating um, too much dairy? Um, you know, are, are we consuming um, too too much fat in cooking? Um, lots of different things to take into account there. Um, and I think we'd probably need a little bit more information, but too much iodine. I mean, I, I, I don't think so. I uh, taking iodine could be problematic. Uh, my brother being one of them suffers with, um, uh, he's, uh, he's hype, he's hyperthyroid. Mm. Um, and that causes issues with him because he was taking iodized salt. Um, which was causing, uh, it was it, it was exacerbating issues with his hyperthyroidism. Um, so I mean, in that case, he had to take it out, and now he's 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 having to remove other compounds that contain um, iodine, uh, and and gravitate more towards red meat and coming away from chicken and liver and, and other compounds that he was consuming. Um, is it going to cause weight gain? I don't know. Unless it's going to cause you to become hypo. Um, any thoughts, Steve? Yeah, yeah. Actually, well, carbimazole is um, a, a thing that stops the production of T4 and T3. So you've got somebody that's hyper. So that sort of, that medication makes sense, doesn't it? Because you're trying to reduce the amount of thyroid horm hormone that's produced. I'm not saying it makes sense uh, globally. I'm just saying if you look at the question, why that would be the meds, it would be that. So, but the person's not losing weight. And they're also taking three drops of iodine, which you can you can do a test. You can do a urinary clearance test for iodine. And I, I've used this before for people because we deal with people in, all over the world. So just a theoretical 100 units of iodine, uh, you drink it, and over a 24-hour period, they, they measure your urine at different phases. And then if, for instance, you excrete out 100 units of iodine, you're not deficient. If you are deficient, your body would suck it all up. You see, so you could actually see whether you need it or not. I'm not saying to go out and rush and pay lots of money to have that test because it is expensive because someone has to do the urine analysis over 24 hours, you know, over, you know, uh, sort of intervals over that time. So um, this is possibly where it, the, 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 the thing where people say, oh, if I take iodine, I, it makes you gain weight. This is maybe where it comes from when somebody has a lot of things going on. Now, if you've been on and off carnivore, BBBE, on and off for three years, you see, off could be the problem. You've got to get fat adapted. Uh, many people say we've got to be in ketosis for a long period of time. Well, that's sort of true, but sort of isn't as well. You, if you're eating in a ketogenic style where you're not really eating carbohydrates, it doesn't really matter so much if you're in ketosis or not, because what you'll see is your insulin will drop and your fat storage will drop. Um, and what sort of weight is it? Is it subcutaneous fat? Is it water weight? So 
Um, I think you've said that you've signed up for our channel, which I'm assuming is the school community, which is free, absolutely, and you get lots of backup, and we do a live Q&A on a Monday at 5 p.m. So hopefully, sally Ann, we can get to know you a bit better and give you a little bit more guidance than we can sort of in a general meeting like this. Um, definitely going to help off. you. Uh, so tomorrow just, we could do yeah. that. You could dive in. Um, but would you would you would you agree, Steve, in regards to maybe dropping the iodine if it's a case of hyper? I mean, it, it seems counterintuitive. Yes, to add exactly, the iodine. Yeah, because yeah, that's that's the route I was going to go down. Because what you're doing with iodine or iodine, however wherever you live, um, is your your giving your body the functional units of the thyroid. You're giving them the raw material to make thyroid hormone. But there, you're also taking a medication to stop the production of thyroid hormone. Don't so th it. that was where I was going when I said the first bit sort of makes sense, but the second bit doesn't, even though I was doing it around the wrong way. So I think that's the thing to look at. What do you want to do? Do you want to produce more or do you want to cut down on the production of it? So it could also yeah. be you know, the ratios. So there is a bit more. There's a fly in the studio. So let, let's move on. We, do you think we've covered that okay for now? Yeah, I think so. I mean, in, in terms of the weight gain, it's I'd be more concerned about the, the, the iodine, iodine, however you want to pronounce it. Um, I'd, I'd take that out personally. Uh, but again, you know, you're the man to speak to in regards to testing to see if you actually need it. But it, it just seems counterintuitive. Uh, I think yes. we can probably go into more detail in the private group tomorrow, which we are live at five tomorrow. Uh, and maybe we can get some more um, content or some more information from Sally and, and maybe guide her a little bit yeah. further down the journey. There's, there. there's a link in the description and you don't have to be in the UK to join, by the way. Okay. Saved. Hi, Dr. Mindy Perez talks about women needing more carbs during ovulation time and before period. What is your view? I lost weight on carnivore, but after 15 months gained body fat hormones. Um, so let's break this down. Uh, do we need carbs? No, not at all. We never need carbohydrate. Um, it's an energy um, deficiency, shall we say, around ovulation. So you just need to eat more, eat more fat, eat more fat, eat more protein. Um, the body will create any glucose that it needs through a process called gluconeogenesis. Uh, you certainly do not need any exogenous carbohydrate for this. You just need to eat more food around that time, fat and protein. Uh, that's part one. Uh, I lost weight on carnivore, um, but after 50 months, I gained. Yeah, it, it, what type of weight have you gained? I mean, have you stored fat? Um, I lost 107 pounds in my journey uh, gravitating keto carnivore. Now I'm probably maybe a stone heavier than that now, but my body fat percentage is still single figures. Um, my body is heavier in lean muscle mass. It's probably stronger with bone because, uh, yes, protein builds bone. Protein and salt build bone. In fact, you cannot build bone without protein and without salt. Pro uh, bone is mineralized protein. Um, a lot more units needed than just calcium. And, in fact, calcium is only a, a small contributing factor to that. Um, so have, have you gained fat uh, or is it just body weight? Um Hormones, uh, I, it depends how damaged the body is. I think a lifetime of a boost of lack of saturated fats leads to hormonal issues. But in my experience, many people seem to get back on top of these when they consume um, enough of the right foods. You, you could not be consuming enough. You may be consuming too much. Um, when ketogenic and carnivore, it's easy to get carried away with adding compounds to coffee, for example, like maybe double cream or drinking too much A2 milk or consuming too much cheese um, or even eggs uh, or cooking in fats where maybe you don't need to be. So I've removed all my fat from cooking. Um, if I want to gain weight on carnivore, um, I'll eat uh, cheese and I'll consume Greek yogurt uh, and I'll have double cream if I want in my coffee. If I'm looking to lose body fat, then those are the first things to go. Fats in cooking, cheese, uh, any double cream, um, and and any milk, which I haven't consumed milk for, for quite some number of years because even A2 causes that intestinal permeability. Brilliant. Yeah, and just uh, thanks to Jari for the £5 super chat, just thanking us for our content. That's great. Um, you can always do a super chat to 
jump your question up to the top or if you just want to show a little bit of love and support. Um, yes, I, I just would like to say that, that there are many reasons why you could possibly gain body fat on carnivore. And we're going to come to that in a minute because there was a question on school and the person that asked the question in our school community has got a brilliant question and we'll come to that in a bit more detail in a minute. So, right, uh, let's have a look at the next thing, which is, hello, chaps, a question for Richard. When are you releasing the carnivore electrolytes and can I pre-order them on your website? They will be available at the end of this month. Woo so super excited. Yeah, super exciting. Um, they look incredible, and I think any hardened carnivore is gonna love them. They taste the salt water. So and I, I this is why you know people gravitating into the lifestyle are not gonna enjoy them, but this is why the other the you know the other electrolytes, my money tin, you know, they work really well because they are sweetened with with stevia, just a little bit of stevia. Um but yeah, they, they're doing at the end of the month. I haven't put them on pre-order because I'll be honest, as, as much as it's brilliant to get cash up front, it just causes loads of issues in regards to fulfilling orders and replying to people's emails morning because the goods haven't been shipped on time. And so I'm going to wait until they arrive, but they will be in soon. And as soon ha as they arrive, I will let you know when you can get those on order. Super exciting. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, I, I will order some, definitely, when they're in. I'm looking forward to them. Uh, so then we've got a question uh, do, 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 from Herbert, I believe. doesn't seem to be a question, more of a statement, but cruciferous vegetables are teeming also with thalamine, or thalamine, sorry, uh, which is a, a metal, isn't it? Yeah, it causes issues with breathing, I think, in the lungs and, and yeah, it's, mm. it's, it's, it's a metal yes. that causes issues in the body. I can't see in the chat where that's come from. It must Somebody must have put something that's in Herbert. there. But, um, oh, what, oh, well, from earlier on? Yeah, someone, possibly. Well, someone was recommending cruciferous vegetables, were they? Quite possibly. It's I been can't. It's been yeah. a long day. It's been a long mm. day. So let's do the next thing. Oh, yes. Uh, Matthew. <laughs> Uh, what I think he's asked about this before. What are your thoughts on milk thistle, which I think many people use because it's you know an alleged, uh, it's a flavonoid, isn't it? And it's um, it's an antioxidant. What do you well, think? Is is it an antioxidant really? <laughs> <There's>... <laughs> well, no, that's what they, that's what they say, isn't it? Yeah. So there's you know these flavonoids um, are detrimental. Well, our health. They're not the healthy compounds that we are led to believe. They are digestive inhibitors. They block the absorption of vitamin C. Jeez, man. Um, they cause a reduction in net protein utilization. It can cause infertility uh, in women, low sperm count in men. Um, and they block thyroid peroxidase, which we need to make thyroid hormones. So flavonoids, in my opinion, are never good. Uh, again, you know, it comes back to where you are on your diet. If you are not live in a ketogenic carnival lifestyle and you want to heal and repair your liver, then possibly. I mean, I remember back in the day where I used to go out partying quite regular, you know, we would use these compounds in order to help prevent hangover and help the liver recover. Um, so again, in that setting, it may be beneficial, but what's the best way to heal and repair your liver? It's by being ketogenic, you know, the production of ketones cleans out the liver no end and reverses fatty liver disease and, and reduces inflammation. It does all of these magical things. If you are ketogenic or carnivore, I don't see a benefit of using these compounds personally. No, and if you, if you take the carbs out, your liver is having a day off from pr processing the carbs into fat and uh, keep away from fruit so you're not stuffing yourself full of fructose. And that's going to be good for your liver as well. So just... Um... Just those two things, really, I think is a good good thing. So here we have a new person who is uh, in our school, another new member, which is good. This came up in school today. Fat gain on carnivore. There's a three part to this. Ben Bickman states insulin is required for fat storage, which is which is true. Um, I Matthew got in there again. Sorry. And um, if that's correct, what's the process for fat storage within our car carnivore insulin levels? when they are low and stable. So firstly, are they low and stable? Well, 
maybe not. You know, this is one of the things that we've seen when I take bloods. Uh, sorry to jump straight in, Richard, but I mean, I've seen thousands of bloods and people that go to carnivore initially, and we do fasted insulin, fasted glucose, C-peptide, which is a great proxy marker for insulin production. You know, you can see that the levels of insulin are still there. Now, that doesn't mean it's the insulin that's causing the fat storage. Uh, you need to have insulin for a fat cell to grow. That's definitely true. But um, you need to give it something to stick into that fat cell. So there are many things on carnivore that we could, could be causing you a problem. One thing that is very strange for people to get is it's nothing to do with diet sometimes. It's to do with stress. So if you're very stressed, your body is protective. That's the first thing. So it holds on to the fat. That makes sense if you want to look at evolution. What's going to protect your organs the best? What's going to insulate your organs? What's going to protect you from stresses from outside? A little bit of subcontinuous fat is going to do that. You can uh, also look at the fact that stress causes blood glucose to increase, which will in obviously increase your insulin. So even if you're eating fantastically, if you're stressed, you will put weight on. Uh, you won't be optimal, put it that way. So that's one thing. Lack of sleep. Well, what lack of sleep can do it because um, that's the stress. So you also can be out of your circadian rhythms. So when your blood glucose in the morning for most people is, is slightly high. If you get up too early, you can push it higher than it naturally want to be. So some people could say, I, I normally wake up and it's 120. Well, this morning I woke up it was 180. Right. Well, if it was 180, you need about a third more insulin to bring it back down to normal. So lack of sleep, stress can do it. Yes, you can overeat. That is physically possible. Or you can overeat the things that are bad for you. So I might be great with dairy, which I'm not, but I could be. But I know I'm not. If I eat dairy, if I have too much cream, if I have um, too much yogurt, which are carnivore foods, I will gain weight. I'm not talking about calories now. I'm talking about types of food. So I would have to replace the cream by, say, not having a decaf coffee in the morning cream in. Uh, so I drop the coffee, which brings us on to other substances. So caffeine can make your adrenals chuck out some cortisol and put your blood glucose up. Uh, one that Rich doesn't like me saying, but it is true. Some people, artificial sweeteners can cause a problem for some people. Whether it's a sweetener or it's the fact that it's making you want sweet things and then you go off and eat the wrong things. You know, whichever way you want to look at it, for some people, taking artificial sweeteners out does help some people. Uh, diet sodas. You see now diet sodas definitely can put weight on you. I've had that categoric. Um, one person, she took out two cans of Diet Coke a day over six months and lost 27 pounds and didn't change anything else. So there's tons of different reasons. It could be the time you eat. It could be the frequency that you eat, even with the same volume. So it could be isocaloric if you want to talk about calories, but we don't. Um, you could be eating the same thing and start at eight o'clock in the morning and finish at one in the afternoon and get a different result if you started at one and finished at eight with the same amount of food. So it's very individual. Uh, uh, if it sounds like a rant, it isn't. I'm trying to cover every base. We did actually answer it all, or I did answer it all on school. But the, it isn't just about insulin. Insulin is a player because you do need insulin for fat storage. That absolutely is it. But we can have a low insulin state, but we don't have zero insulin. So it's going to be there. And if your liver is full of glycogen and your muscles are full of glycogen and there is some blood sugar around and it can't go into your liver and it can't go into your muscles, it will go into the fat cells. And that's even on a lean person. So ridiculously, though it sounds, if you are a lean athlete, an average height male lean athlete of 30, you will have something like 50,000 calories of energy in fat on you, even though you look at that person and think, they have no fat on them. So it there is a lot to it. It's a great question. And uh, I get why you're saying it, because we talk about insulin being the driver for fat storage. But um, it's, it's a player. It's not the thing. So, for instance, if you were fasting, it's very unlikely that you would gain any weight. Very unlikely. But some people can do a whole day fast and not lose any weight. So what's going on there? Well, their body is retaining that weight. 
but you might get the weight loss the next day. So there's a lot more going on. Is that all right, Rich? Yep, sounds good. Training can also cause overtraining, can also cause a stress, and not to forget the protein also elicits an insulin response uh, in, through the activation of mTOR, i.e. leucine and, and alanine. Um, we need insulin, and as you say, we're never in a zero insulin state. We, it's um, it's impossible for us to do so. So, yeah, I think you've covered all the bases. Great answer. Thank you very much. I like to get a tick off of Richard. Once a week, man. I got used to adding a little sea salt to my drinking water. I now find plain water unpalatable. Your thoughts on this? Yeah, snap. It. Uh, I can't drink water by itself. I find it bland. I've never been a lover of water, but it's and it's the same with <clears throat> when it comes to salting my meals. I sometimes put lashings on, and other times I don't put any. So my body, your body's incredibly clever. It will tell you when it needs salt and when it doesn't. There we are. Fantastic. Yeah, um, that's so not, just listen. That's not plain. That's not plain water, is it? No. Clearly not. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I mean, I like plain water sometimes. So I, th I think for once a week, man, it's just just a matter of taste, literally. Um, and there's certainly nothing like, wrong with consuming. Yeah, yeah, there's nothing wrong with it if you like it. Uh, so the, the Gaza guy from um, the school, if I'm allowed another, would Richard suggest? What would Richard suggest for a prep? Fat protein ratio macro during a cutting phase. Yeah, it's been a long day, Stephen, isn't it? <laughs> it has. And I started badly and I'm finishing badly. So let's read it again. If I'm allowed another, what would Richard suggest for protein stroke fat macros during a cutting phase? So look, th this is highly individual. Um, nothing's ever straightforward in regards to this, but um, protein is generally a constant. So, I mean, aim for... 0.82 to 1 grams uh, of protein per pound of body weight. This will allow you to um, still grow, believe it or not, while losing body fat. The growth will be considerably lower than if you were consuming adequate nutrients, uh, but you can still grow while losing fat. The minimum protein that you want to go to prevent muscle loss is 0.5 grams per pound. Obviously, these figures do adjust ever so slightly depending on the individual. Um, the lever that we pull is the fat lever. We lower, now fat is incredibly important. Every cell in your body is made of protein. Every cell in your body is made of fat. This is why we do not need any exogenous carbohydrate. Um, but the lever that we pull here is the fat lever. The less fat that we consume, the more fat that the body is going to um, use for beta oxidation and we're going to burn more body fat. Um, somebody on the live earlier asked a question in regard to protein sparing modified fasting, which is where you just consume lean protein. Um, Dr. Chafee wasn't a fan of this. Um, for a tool, I think it can work really well. Uh, but as a tool, it's not fit for a healthy lifestyle per se. And if you are going to implement taking fat out completely, then do it uh, periodically, i.e. every other day um, or maybe just once you know, a week or once every few days. And that uh, frequency is going to, be, going to be dependent on you. The second that you feel start to feel fatigued, start to feel nauseous, um, then you need to put the fat back in. Fat is really important. I can't emphasize this enough. Protein should always be consumed with fat for health. If health is the goal, which is what it should be with everybody on this channel, uh, protein should always be consumed with fat. If you are going to dabble with protein sparing spare modified fasting, i.e. losing as much of the fat as you can, you need to do it carefully. Um, so do approach it with caution. It is something that I used during my uh, my cutting when I was competing, um, but I wasn't healthy. This is not healthy. Um, two, two to three percent body fat is not healthy, um, but it will come. It will come. You could even, instead of lowering or completely removing the fat on said days, you could lower the fat ever so slightly. And it could just be as simple as removing the cheese or taking, you know, one or two egg yolks out, um, dropping the double cream if you are consuming, taking the milk out, or even just removing the fat from cooking. I add fat to cooking sometimes because I think it's incredible. I love cooking in butter, tallow. I love cooking in lard and ghee. Um, but I don't do it very often. I generally cook 
in the juices from the meats that I'm cooking. I'll pop the lid on the pan. I pan fry everything. I pop the lid on the pan and it cooks in its own heat. The juices come out. It cooks in its own fat. Um, sometimes I pour that fat on my food and other times I don't. Um, even just doing that and removing that excess fat will see a shift uh, in a positive direction. But keep the protein um, at, a, at a stable level, around one gram per pound. Um, and again, you can drop down to 0.82 grams per pound uh, and even as low as 0.5. But you really want to be careful with the protein. Every cell in your body is made of protein. It's incredibly important to keep that in. Yes, brilliant. And uh, just for Catherine, who said, how do you sign up for school? Couldn't find it. I put the link in the chat. So I uh, hope that's all right for you, Catherine. But it is also in the description, I believe. Um, next question, Tom. The, uh, the iodine topic is very interesting. Lately, I've heard more and more people healing both hyper and hypo with mega doses of iodine. But I guess it quite depends on the context of the person. Yeah. And also the context of the condition, you see. Um, it, it, you do have to make thyroid hormone, whether you're hyper or hypo. It's the regulation and also a lot to do with the, um, what's the word I'm looking for, when it goes from T4 to T3, conversion. <laughs> so you can find you make the same amount of T4, whether you're hypo or hyper, but one person converts most of it to T3 and the other person doesn't convert it very well. And that you can have the same, um, you know, you can have twins with that situation as well because their peripheral tissues work working differently. And a lot of that is to do with diet and a lot of that is to do with cofactors like selenium and zinc. So um, th this is why it's a difficult topic because you will get somebody saying, I'm hyper and I took iodine and it worked. Yes, well, it didn't work necessarily by making more T4. It just helped with your conversion factor, so maybe better quality as well. So anyway, right, um, it's an interesting subject, I definitely think. And if you go to school, by the way, we have free ebooks all about it. And I've got one that I did, a summary of Ken Berry talking to Dr. David Brownstein about iodine, which is a very famous video, hundreds of thousands of views. David Brownstein is is the iodine guy, and uh, you can get a free ebook. So sign up for school. I mean, we might do a screenshot of what it's like. If you haven't signed up, I think you should. Right. Um, Sorry, Steve. I, I was just laughing because we throw out all of these massive words, and you couldn't you couldn't remember conversion. It's one of those days. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, it has been a long day. I'm exceptionally tired today. Right. Um, that's because yesterday I did something I've never done before. Uh, and that I did bouldering and there was a gym there. Bouldering is, like, is, whoa, is, you know, climbing up the walls without ropes and stuff like that. And I did that and there was a gym there. And like an idiot, because I like the gym, I did the bouldering and then I did the gym. So I pushed myself a bit too far. And I was up at five o'clock this morning doing some other bits and pieces because we deal with people around the world. And uh, I had an emergency sort of thing to help somebody with. So anyway, right, here we are. Rick, uh, who is possibly one of the carnivores that's been around the longest eating this way? He eats cheese and yogurt daily and he never gains weight. And that's exactly what I was trying to say. Everyone is so different. Um, some people I would just really survive. yeah st I, I just add to, to add to that Steve I think that's just testament to I think Rick's been carnival for an incredibly long time as he so his body mm. is not um doesn't have the damage that the rest of us uh, uh, um have put our bodies through over the years point, um yeah. you know and it's you know we see this with with Dr Chafee for example he's been a carnival for such, for such a long time his requirement for electrolytes isn't there he doesn't need any additional electrolytes because he gets much of it from well all of it from the food that he, he eats so that's the beauty of being carnivore for prolonged periods of time your body will adapt and um yeah the proof is in the steak yeah oh i like it the proof is in the protein right anyway adam smith that's any better. benefit <laughs> adam smith any benefit to eating some carbs nah prior to a run or a race been keto 14 years Carnivore, 15 months, experienced some increased performance when applied. Super compensation of glycogen with fat adaption. Thoughts? So, look, it's this is the never-ending um, 
topic when it comes to the athletes that I work with. They look for this um, superior metabolic flexibility in which they can become fat adapted and start to put carbohydrate back in again. When they do, they generally find that it doesn't do an awful lot. Um, it does work like a drug. So it can have that um, ergogenic effect. Um, same as caffeine. If you were to put caffeine in halfway through a race, you know, you would see an, an enhanced um, performance. Um, I mean, what are we looking at? Is, is it an energy aspect? Well, no, because beta hydroxybutyrate is superior energy. Um, is it a glycogen issue? Quite possibly. Now, one of the studies that I'm looking at currently, I meant, I'm, I think I mentioned in the live earlier, unless I was dreaming, um, fantastic study, which looks at the body's ability to adapt into um, glycogen storage in regards to training without carbohydrate. And we can, we can upregulate things like citrate and had um, uh, mitochondrial function uh, capillaries. Um, and when we put carbohydrate in, can it have a positive effect? We, we see it, it is possible. Um, there are athletes all over the world who utilize carbohydrate during events, but do not use it, or at least very rarely in training. I'm not against carbohydrate. I personally think that you don't need it. If I put carb in during an event, it causes me a, a world of, of no, no end of problems. So it doesn't work for me, but I'm not an elite athlete in regards to running and cycling either. Um, you know, it, if it confers a benefit, then it is, it's a tool. So utilize it, but try to do it from clean carb. If you can, white rice is probably preferable because it's lectin free. Um, but again, if you're only using it during race day, then, you know, the damage caused through oxidative stress and the damage to the NAD plus to NADH ratio is going to be minimal. Um, it's a tool. If it works for you, keep it in. But personally, I mean, one of the guys that I'm working with now, he's taken so long to remove carb completely and he's just gone to another level. Um, but I mean, your 14 years carbohydrate, uh, sorry, keto, if it works, it's a tool. Um, who's, who am I thinking of? Um, who is the athlete that trained Chelsea Sodaro? Um, Steve, can you remember? Oh, my goodness. I yeah. messaged him recently. Yeah. One of you will probably pop in the chat now, but he, he has a say in um, right fuel, right time. So uh, carnivore, ketogenic, utilizes carbs for specific training and for um, uh, event days. And he is the world record holder for an amateur in regards to, uh, I think, age in Ironman, which is something like sub eight hours, um, which is incredible. So look, I'm open to suggestion. It doesn't work for me. It doesn't work for many people that I work with. But just be careful because the second you start dabbling with these compounds, you you begin to want to implement them during training. Um, and again, that study that I mentioned earlier, uh, it does show that if we utilize uh, training without carbohydrate, it, it upregulates all of these pathways. Um so when we do use carbohydrate, we see a bigger benefit. But the danger to this is it could kickstart again any sugar cravings. And then that's a slippery slope. Um, I need to be ab abstinent because it it is a drug and it affects me in big ways if I put compounds like sugar back in. So for me, it's a no-no. But if it works for you, then, you know, carry on. You're, you're getting a lot of quest, uh, questions, Richard. So, John Mortimer, JBM Fitness. Hi, Richard. You answered my question about gout the other day. Since then, I've had a flare-up. Strict carnivore apart from coffee. Five months in with few cheat weekends. Any thoughts? Yeah, coffee could be a contributing factor also. Um, gout flare-ups can occur through uh, the body releasing compounds such as oxalate detox. Um, ben who we had on team uh, GB with us recently said he had a gout flare because he banged his, his foot and he's a strict carnivore. Um, and since then, I think he's removed coffee, hasn't he? And, and porn, <laughs> going by one of his posts that he's put on Facebook recently. So that's an interesting one. Um, look, coffee is a known neurotoxin. Um, the compound acrylamide causes inflammation um, severely in some people. Take the coffee out and see how you get on. But there are a number of contributing factors. Uh, strict carnivore is going to see the biggest benefit. 
um, in regards to being lion because there are uh, certain fats in compounds like chicken and pork um, that can cause issues in regards to being oxidized. Um, these compounds are highly inflammatory, and if you are over-consuming, then they could cause problems as well. So eat beef and lamb, take the coffee out, and I know it's tough. Uh, coffee is highly addictive. Um, and see how you get on. Report back in a week or two, but um, I should I should imagine that you'll see uh, either a complete resolution or massive improvement by then. Yeah, I think we should keep a little diary. Report back in two weeks. Report we'll, back in two we'll weeks. Take a, yeah. take a register at the beginning. <laughs> and uh, if you're not here, get in trouble. Peter Jones has been... Um, Peter Jones? No, a big shopping place in London. Anyway, Peter Jones. Carnivore for 15 months managed to close up a two millimeter gap in my front teeth when the dentist said it couldn't be done. So as Rich said, protein and salt builds bone. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So that's pretty good. We like that. Uh, let's get rid of Peter's question. Get Andy's up. Oh, that was a statement, really. Uh, Andy, C77. Oxalate can cause gout-like symptoms. That means Spot coffee. Mm-hmm. See, we educate everybody, and then they, they say it all back to us, which is interesting, isn't it? Uh, oh, a question for me. According to you, me, that is, what are the optimal levels of fasting insulin and C-peptide? Many people claim they like to see it below, uh, even below the lower bound. Well, um, optimal levels, there are really no such thing. So the average uh, range for insulin is... Uh, 0 0.5 nanograms per milliliter to, uh, sorry, this is, yeah, C-peptide, 0 0.5 milli, ha -ha, 0 0.5 nanograms per milliliter up to two. And the fasting insulin, I'm, I'm going to have to look up because my brain has gone to mush. Unless you remember it, Richard? I can't off the top of my head. Apologies. You are the bloods man, yeah. so I leave these ones for yeah. you. Yeah, a bit <laughs> annoying that, but yes, uh, fasting insulin should be um, uh, between 2.6 and 24.9 micro units per milliliter, which is like the little Latin sort of thing. Right, hope that was fine. Um, we got another question about your new electrolytes. It feels like we've really uh, set this up to sell your electrolytes, but these are real questions. Oh, and it's Matthew. Here we go. Will your new electrolytes powder contain the same amount of minerals, astroxanthin and vitamin uh, as your ones with the stevia in? Yes, without the stevia or the vitamin C. Um, so, yeah, it's completely natural. The only thing, the only compound in the electrolytes, which, I mean, is natural, is the stevia. But it does come from a plant. So from a, a perspective of a carnivore, anybody wanting to remove complete plant compounds um, may not want to consume stevia. And again, coming back to what Stephen said, it can cause uh, an issue with incretins and lead to an insulin response. It is few and far between. Stevia and erythritol are the, are the sweeteners and glycerol that don't seem to have that effect on most people, but it's still possible. It's the artificial type sweeteners that cause issues, aspartame and sucralose and saccharin and, and all the other nasties. Um, even xylitol and maltitol, which are polyols and technically natural, they can still contain robe carbs, which uh, can elicit an insulin response. So stevia and erythritol uh, and glycerol are the better options. But this one's going to be free. It's still going to contain astaxanthin, which is, to my knowledge, the only compound on the planet which is a true antioxidant. We have these antioxidant benefits from being keto, uh, keto, ketogenic and carnivore. But when people tout about antioxidants within uh, fruits and vegetables, they're not antioxidants. They begin their journey as pro-oxidants, uh, and they do so by activating or overactivating the NRF2 pathway. Um, and I have to say overactivating there because a ketogenic lifestyle initially activates the NRF2 pathway, but it's short-lived uh, as the body adapts uh, after that shock of coming from eating lots of sugar into carnivore, two to three weeks down the line, NRF2 switches off. But So it is an initial transition. But the NRF2 pathway is the same pathway that is um, elicited through the ingestion of toxic compounds like lead, arsenic, mercury, uh, exhaust fumes, tobacco smoke, and so on and so forth. So this is what vegetables do to you. Um, I'm not trying to put anyone off vegetables if they are ketogenic. 
um, just more to emphasize the fact of predominant animal proteins. But that's what astaxanthin is. It is the only known um, antioxidant that doesn't begin its journey as a pro-oxidant. Um, I think there's over a thousand clinical trials. Uh, so an awesome compound. But yeah, it's going to be free of the vitamin C and stevia. Um, and it's all all natural as always, but without any plant compounds. Brilliant. 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 Just Em. Hi, Emma. Still eating intuitively. I've been thinking about chicken where for the past two years, I haven't wanted it at all. Just air fried some drumstick drumsticks with skin on and feel satiated. Staying observant. Yeah, that's good because um, I've just gone through this phase as well. Chicken thighs with skin on in the air fryer has been my little go to snack. So, yeah. Um, what you start your carnivore journey with doesn't tend to be how you continue it. So when I started, I really was a ribeye guy and really loved the red meat. And now I'm finding, I mean, I had a fish dish at the bouldering, which when I do my what I eat in a day, you won't believe the platter of fish. It was amazing. So anyway, right. Um, saved. Do you know any women who are carnivore and peri uh, stroke menopausal? Do they have problems with body weight and body fat? Uh, my answer is some do and some don't. Sorry to be really vague, but it is very individual. Spot on. You, you took the words right out of my mouth. Um, I can think of maybe six to ten off the top of my head now who are complete opposite ends of the scale. Um, yeah. One of which, you know, Sarah, who is now... Um, super lean. She's lost, I think, mm. nearly seven stone. She was uh, clinically obese, type two diabetic for 23 years. Um, came to see me. She's now diabetic free, and now uh, at the age of 50, she's qualified for Team GB in triathlon in her first year of competing. Um, she struggles to gain weight, although um, she went through a phase for a long time where she couldn't stop losing the weight. And I just told her to stop worrying. The body will find its natural level of homeostasis. And when it did, the weight began to come back on. Uh, but that's where the body is happy. And now, you know, she's a lot fitter and healthier with her weight that has done this and bounced back a little bit. Um, and again, there's other factors in regards to, to you know, muscle and um, uh, water retention. Glycogen, because we still store glycogen as ketogenic and carnivore, despite uh, common uh, misconception. Um, but yeah, in, in answer to the question, I did do to what Steve said. You took the words right out of my mouth. Some do it yeah. and some don't. So we've got uh, a thing here that's interesting for you to see. Uh, Lydia is saying, for your information, Eddie Abu is going carnivore from this week. And uh, Noi, 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 is it, uh, Eddie Abu is an orb. He pushed yeah. <laughs> the jab and the mask mandate. I followed him and lost all interest. Uh, S-H-I-T is his favorite word. Right. So, <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm not a big fan either, I'll be honest. Okay. We won't get into that. No. Uh, <laughs> right. Here we go. Uh, I think we're spoiled now with electrolytes. I always drank a lot of water, but drink more now. I will definitely be buying the unflavored sugar. Right. So that's that. Right, here's the next one. Saved. Where can I get a fast in insulin test online or in London, if you know? I asked my GP. They don't want to do it. They say blood glucose is all they care about. No help from them. Well, you know, this is just ridiculous because you can have great blood glucose. Uh, you could have two twins with great blood glucose. They could look very different. And then when you test their insulin, one of them has perfect levels of insulin and the other one has very super high levels of insulin and it's because they've got super levels super high levels of insulin that they have the same blood glucose as the person that has the normal insulin because it's all about getting the blood glucose to that homeostatic level where we want it roughly a teaspoon of sugar in five liters of blood that's what you want so uh in the background you've got this insulin so your blood Glucose goes up and the insulin goes up, follows it. Nice curve, brings it back down. Whereas some people, that in, that blood glucose goes up, and woo, there's a spike of insulin that's needed because the insulin sensitivity, it working at the cell level, is different. So you need more insulin. And I think Jason Fung did a very good uh, sort of thing, thought experiment. He said, you know, uh, in the underground trains in Japan, when the doors open, because there's lots of people so you imagine that the tube train is the cell 
and the people are glucose, uh, when there's lots of glucose, you have they actually have they employ people to push, you know, the, the train operator has people employed to push people into the train, which I've seen in Japan, by the way, and it is quite interesting. It's all done very politely. Now, if you have resistant people to this push, you need more people pushing, and that's it. That's that's it. So you end up with the same amount of people in the train, but you've got more of these pushers, these which represents insulin. So it is really vital to understand what's going on in your body. Uh, fasting insulin is vital. Blood glucose does not tell you the whole story. Um, you could even argue that knowing what your ketones are would be interesting, especially with you, you know if you're looking at things like managing cancer. It's very good to know the glucose to ketone index and all that. But anyway, um, where do you get it from? Right. You could look up Medichex. I'm not, not sure if they do it. That's spelled M-E-D-I-C-H-E-K-S, Medichex. Or you could just look online. There will be people in the UK that do a fasted insulin test. And uh, Richard is on it right now. So um, we, sh we shall let him look that up. Yeah, insulin what resistance blood test. Medichex is the company that I use for my testing. Not that I test anymore, really. I just do it for the benefit mm -hmm. of others. Um, but yeah, there's an insulin resistance test. I haven't gone into the detail about it, but it's uh, £79. Uh, I know they do offer um, uh, discounts regularly on, on Medichex, but they, so they're testing for four metrics, gluco uh, glucose, insulin, Fasting insulin and fasting insulin resistance index. So you can get that. It's seventy nine pound, uh, but that is going to tell you way more than a glucose tolerance test will ever tell you. Because as Stephen says, diabetes yeah. or insulin resistance begins ten to fifteen years prior. Brilliant. There you go. So I hope that's helpful. Um, so we've got a question for Rich, and then we'll talk about the next. Uh, section of the show after eight o'clock. So Beth would like to know, what would you suggest for keto rash? Both times I've tried keto, it's made it impossible to carry on. Too much fat. So you need to reduce the fat. Um, it's a bile issue. Um, so take any fats out of cooking, remove sort of double cream if you're consuming it with coffee, um, cook your meat again without any added fats and try to eat more regularly, smaller meals. Uh, so maybe eat two to three times per day. Um, try not to do extended amount of fasting and then bombard in the body with lots of protein and fat, which is typically what we do within the keto carnivore community because we are feast and fast animals. But for this case, um, you need to upregulate bile production. And in order to do that, you need to drip feed it. Uh, in regards to the volume of fat that you put in. So lower the amount of fat that you are consuming. Excellent. Right. So uh, now to the business end of this uh, operation. Um, if you want to watch us from 8 o'clock, we're on a different platform that rhymes with Apple Crumble. Before uh, you jump and... into this, Steve, before you on, on, when we jump on to the, the other platform, I had two questions that I've been messaged in the week that I said I would bring up today, but we'll do that on the other platform because we've okay. been so busy with this one, which is fantastic. And it was to do with um, using MCTs and maybe ketones and explaining uh, why they may be beneficial and what they do within the body and whether we should take them at all. Um, so I did kindly reply to these messages and say to join the live and we would speak about it, but we've been luckily inundated with questions by you fantastic mm. people. So we'll cover this on the other platform. Excellent. If that's, okay. that's great. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So in the chat, I've just put the link to the show on Apple Crumble. The other platform starts at 8 o'clock. And also, Rich, do you want to talk about something that's happening this Easter weekend called the War on Health? Yes, the War on Health, a fantastic event uh, held by uh, Phil Escott and Ben Hunt, um, who have kindly asked Stephen and I to speak at the event. Stephen is speaking um, about bloods and testing and ranges, and well, I won't give too much away. I'm sure he can fill you in on um, the bits that he's going to speak about, but that's going to be incredible. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what I'm speaking about, <laughs> partly because I haven't written it yet, but <laughs> um, but it's going to be a fantastic event. It's a two-day event. It's uh, a small event. It isn't going to be 
a big event in which you're not going to get an opportunity to speak you know with the speakers there this is a mixing and blending and speaking you know outside of 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 the guys talking on stage so it, it's a, it's a, an incredibly close event uh, it's an opportunity for for you guys to come along and speak to Stephen and I in person ask any questions tell some stories um you know it's going to be incredibly friendly with food and, and all sorts of stuff so it isn't a strict event in which you're not going to get your hands on any of the speakers um i'll be there for the two days uh, stephen's coming on the sunday um i'm mm -hmm. speaking on the sunday and i believe stephen is also and we are going to be part of the q a um on the sunday and if there is a q a on the saturday i will also be part of that too but i will be there uh for the two days so book your tickets um Steve, I think, has popped a link, I possibly. Have, I have. I have put um, a link in there. Oh, and, and I've also just put a link in for the Rumble show, yeah. So uh, and if you use, sorry, Steve, two seconds, we just jump on with this. If you use a discount code, um, Coach Stephen or Richard, so use Richard because it looks better on me. You will... Or Stephen, <laughs> not Coach Stephen. Oh, just Stephen. Yeah. Stephen. You, you will create. receive £50 off. So get that booked mm. in and incredible event i can't wait and i look forward to seeing you all there yeah it should be good it should be good so we've uh, ended up with three minutes to go which is uh, unusual for us but i just wanted to make sure that people knew that they could come to this easter weekend it is in the middle of england and there is accommodation and you can either pay for the uh conference or you can pay a big, uh, you know, for the accommodation on site as well, which is which is obviously slightly slightly extra because you're paying for the accommodation. But it is something I'm looking forward to. I'm going to have some of my books there, so you uh, the heart, how to be a carnival will be there, and um, I'll have guide to bloods and possibly my diabetes book. But anyway, um, they'll be there to purchase as paperbacks if you're interested. Right, um, and there's a quick question that's just come in, and it's a super chat, so let's do that. Had gout last week and read it's a buildup of uric acid. So I soaked my foot one times a day for half an hour in Epsom salt, sodium bicarb and potassium bicarb. Gout gone in three days. Did the electrolytes neutralize the uric acid? Quite possibly. I mean, if we look at what gout is, um, they say it's to do with an increase in purines. Um, you know, uric acid, which can come from purines, it also comes from fructose and fruit, and it is uh, produced in the body. But it exists in normal joints, and it's typically an antioxidant. Most of it's excreted. Um, can it be? I, I guess it could be a case of the electrolytes. I mean, electrolytes are super important, and as you know, I'm a massive advocate of it. But uh, fructose, uh, any sugar compounds, all of these are got to be removed. Um Fructose is the only sugar that uh, that generates uric acid in its own metabolism, monosodium uric crystals, uh, and they're formed by uric acid. So these these monosodium uric crystals activate a number of inflammatory pathways, um, which lead it lead to uh, a major gout attack. So fructose can be readily uh, depleted by ATP and um, G. What's the other one? GTP, I think, isn't it? But it's could electrolytes. I guess so. I mean, if, if that's worked, then fantastic. I wonder whether you've also removed other compounds such as coffee again, you know, um, or could the flare up have been a case of uh, the oxalate detox and a couple of days later, maybe it's cleared. But, you know, as you know, I'm a massive fan of of, uh, of uh, sodium and potassium. Um, so, yeah, keep them in if it's working, I guess. Yeah, well, the Epsom salts is the application with hot water does work, doesn't it? I mean, Epsom, Epsom salt basically is magnesium. So it could be, we don't know whether it's the three things together or whether it's just one of those things. You know, this is, this is you know, when you do a scientific uh, experiment, you'd have to try that. Exp uh, this is where, why you can't do these things because you don't want you to have gout three times. But you could, try, if, if your next flare up is there, you could try your experiment three days with just Epsom salts and see if that works. You could even try it with just your foot in hot water uh, one times a day for half an hour. You, this is it. You see, you, you need to work out what actually works. Um, it could be a combination, couldn't it, of those, those three things. But it's an interesting thing that you did it, which is great. So we'll leave on that foot, shall we? And we'll go over to the other platform now rich fantastic look forward to it
Thank you all. Yeah. Yeah, you look like a newsreader then at the end of the show, like you were shuffling your notes. I, yeah. I was um, I was making a note there so to, to look into whether electrolytes can neutralize. Um, so, yeah, I'm going right. to look into yeah. that. Yeah, you see, we always want to learn. So anyway, for those day. on YouTube for the last hour, thank you so much. Thank you all. We'll see you on the other platform. <laughs>